In this episode of the Football History Rewind, part number 45, we discuss the elimination of the punt out, scoring after a touchdown, as well as a legendary Cornell team of 1921 and their coach and players. It's all coming up in just a moment. This is the Pigskin Daily History Dispatch, a podcast that covers the anniversaries of American football events throughout history on a day-to-day basis. Your host, Darren Hayes, is podcasting from America's North Shore to bring you the memories of the gridiron one day at a time. So as we come out of the tunnel of the Sports History Network, let's take the field and go no huddle through the portal of positive gridiron history with pigskindispatch.com. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hello, my football friends. This is Darren Hayes of pigskindispatch.com. Welcome once again to the Pig Pen, your portal to positive football history. And we are in our football history rewind, part number 45, and we are still in the year of 1921 because there is so much that happened in the game of football here in the United States and Canada. It's just super exciting. And you know, we're going to get into some more of the 1921 rules revisions first here. Uh, and then we're going to get into one of the great teams that uh, tied for the national championship uh, many years later when people were going back and looking at these great teams. Now, the Roaring Twenties are often remembered as a time of great things in America, at least the years earlier in the decade anyway. We all know what happened at the end of the decade. Uh, football shared in this same period of growth and the joy and the rest of the aspects of American life it did. It's a great example of the old adage, art imitates life, and the game became a solidified staple of American recreation. The NCAA had to keep up with the times and roll with the waves of change in order to keep their beloved game of the gridiron fresh and current to the times. The crowds were getting bigger and bigger every season, and the rules makers knew that besides the element of player safety, they must also focus on fan entertainment when revising the rules. And they did just that before the 1921 season by abolishing one of the strangest concepts of the game by modern views, and it was called the pun out. You're probably sitting there asking yourself, the pun, what? That's what I would ask myself if I heard that for the first time. Yes, it's written correctly, the pun out. The name is foreign to us due to the fact that it was eliminated in both use and name in 1921. We'll try to fully explain its use and methodology and what it did, but remember, it's been an extinct part of football for over 100 years. It might be as difficult to conceive as dinosaurs because we simply have never experienced seeing it. Now, in uh, Timothy P. Brown's How Football Became Football the First 150 Years, he goes into a little bit of explaining, you know, there were some 61 rules in 1876. And... You know, some of them dropped by the wayside by the time 1921 rolled around. But uh, in today's game, uh, Timothy P. Brown explains that there are only about three of those 61 rules from 1876 that are still involved in the game. So many things dropped off, and a big chunk of them dropped off here in 1921. That's why we're spending so many episodes talking about this great year. Now, another author, Tom Perrin, in his book, Football, A College History, explains that a punt out was a concept by which after the score of a touchdown, the team that scored could opt upon a punt by one of their own players from behind his opponent's goal line. Other players from the scoring team would be out in the field of play at the five-yard line, and they tried to prevent their opponents from interfering with a clean, fair catch as a player from the scoring team had to make a fair catch of the punt out. The scored upon team would line up for the punt on the goal line. The other option for the scoring team would be that after attempting a try for point via place kick from the point where the ball carrier crossed the goal line at any distant back that the kicker chose. This was much more preferred option, but the punt out was for those sideline runs where the angle for a kick was less than desirable. So imagine, you know, they run just crossing the goal line by the sideline. You'd have to kick from that really weird angle and the ball, the goal was on the goal line then. So kind of a a crazy thing. So, you know, the sideline run score could force a kick to be made from the 20 or 30 yard line near the sideline, which gave the defense a much smaller angle uh, to defend the goal. A a score on the left sideline made a kick for a right-footed kicker darn near impossible. 
Thus, the punt out was really the only viable option in some cases back in that era after a score. But it's a good problem to have. You just scored a touchdown. <laughs> Well, the new rule in 1921 sort of replaced this. Uh, 1921 NCAA football rule book number 10, the rule number 10, stated that a kick after a touchdown was that, quote, after a touchdown has been scored, any player of the side scoring the touchdown may bring the ball out from the opponent's goal line to any point in front of the opponent's goal. After indicating to the referee the spot of the selection, which shall not be revocable, a try for goal may be tried from that spot, end quote. So the kick must be a place kick, and it had to be held by a holder while touching the ground. No tees or risers, and while the kicker put foot to ball. This differed to the field goals or goals from the field, which could be scored via a drop kick or place kick. Now the punt out option shows up nowhere in the 1921 NCAA football rules, but Perrin still credits the change occurring actually in 1922. Needless to say, no matter what year the revision, it was still a considered revision to the rules of football. Now, Mr. Perrin does point out, though, that in 1922, the teams were given the options of running or passing for points after touchdown from scrimmage as well as kicking the ball over the crossbars. A success of any of the options of a try after all scored the same one point in those days. There was no predetermined measure of the point where the try could be attempted from, so the team could conceivably want to attempt their try via a run from inside the one-yard line, so should they choose. Now, the rules were getting quite a bit closer to what they are today, but there are still many debates, deliberations, and revisions that needed to occur to have the hybrid rules on a try for a point after touchdown. It was extremely fascinating how far the rules have come and how different the appearance of the game was you know, just over a century ago. But please join us soon uh, for some more installments of this series of rules uh, changes in 1921-1922. But before we go away today, let's talk about one of those great uh, teams from 1921. A couple episodes ago, we spoke of how the history was recognized. Six teams in college football that are considered tied for the national championship in 1921. One of those was the Cornell Big Red football team, guided by head coach Gil Doby. Now, Coach Doby had some great success about a decade earlier at the University of Washington in Seattle, where his teams were posted as a flawless record of 58 0 and 3. Washington went on a 40-game win streak at one point during that run, and he left during World War I to coach the U.S. Naval Academy, where his team sports a respectable 18-3 record while he was there. Now, after the war was over is when he arrived at Cornell, guiding the Big Red to three consecutive national titles from 1921 through 1923. The 1921 squad outscored their opponents 392 to 21 with a stellar eight wins and no losses or ties. The closest game they encountered that year was a 14 to zero blanking of Springfield College's red and whites. In the other less competitive games, they blew out Western Reserve 110 to nil and the Penn Quakers, a pretty good team of that area, they beat them 41 to nothing at Franklin Field in Philadelphia, Penn's home field. Now, some of the great players from that team included fullback Eddie Kaw, who was a consensus first-team selection in 1921's All-American football team. There was a tackle, Wilson S. Dodge. He was the team captain, and he also was All-Eastern honors uh, for the team. Quarterback George Fan received All-Eastern honors. Halfback Floyd Ramsey received All-Eastern honors. Halfback G.P. Leckler and E. Cassidy, the end, received Eastern honors. And guard Leonard C. Hansen also received honors for the East. And, and David Munns received East honors. And guard Leonard Hansen, uh, we already mentioned him, he also received honors. I guess he received them twice. No, he just got them once. Uh, if you remember back in our birthday celebration of George Fan in the October 6 football history headlines, we noted that Fan may be the only quarterback in college football history that can claim that he never had been beaten and was never tied in his varsity career. He was honored in 1957 when the National Football Foundation selected his career for inclusion into the College Football Hall of Fame. So it's no wonder with players like that, an outstanding coach, 
that the Cornell Big Red was one of those uh, great champions, those six teams that uh, shares in the national championship scene in 1921 in college football. So thank you for joining us for this great bit of history. We're going to come back uh, next time on Football History Rewind, probably about the next four or five days, and talk some more of this 1921 season and start to spill over in 1922. Uh, But uh, we'll talk about some more of these teams that uh, tie for that championship because there's some really interesting figures, teams, and coaches uh, to, to explain there. So, But we talk about football history each and every day, even when we don't have the football history rewind going. So check us out, Pixie and Dispatch, each and every day, midnight Eastern. We drop a new episode for you. And also you can find us on pigskindispatch.com and on the sportshistorynetwork.com. So till tomorrow, everybody, have a great, great iron day. Peeking up at the clock, the time's running down. We're going to go into victory formation, take a knee, and let this baby run out. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you back tomorrow for the next podcast. We invite you to check out our website, pigskindispatch.com, not only to see the daily football history, but to experience positive football with our many articles on the good people of the game, as well as our own football comic strip, Cleet Marks Comics. Pigskindispatch.com is also on social media outlets, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and don't forget the Pigskin Dispatch YouTube channel to get all of your positive football news and history. Special thanks to the talents of Mike and Gene Monroe, as well as Jason Neff for letting us use their music during our podcast. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get Dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for Dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order.